The IRMAC Centre is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chair's Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations per semester. For the Spring 2011 semester, the presenters belong to the Departments of Biology, Physics, Mathematics, Chemistry, and the School of Resource and Environmental Management. Today's speaker is Dr. Carl Lowenberger. Canada Research Chair in Parasitology and Vectors of Disease Entomology from the Department of Biology. Um, one exciting aspect of Carl is that he's an alumnus from SFU and that he got a Master's in Pest Management um, from SFU in 1988 <coughs> from the Biology Department. Then he went and did his PhD at McGill, graduating in 1993, and then was a postdoctoral fellow and an assistant professor at University of Wisconsin. Then in 2002, we were able to attract him back as a Canada Research Chair um, in Parasites and Vectors of Diseases. And he has uh, won several awards in his years here. He's got a Catalyst Grant from CIHR, a Scholar Award from the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, and he recently got a Challenges Grant from the Gates Foundation. I can't read my brain. <laughs> so, uh, and one of the one of the things that stands out with his research is it is very international uh, flair to it. He studies dengue fever, Chagas disease, and malaria. Of course, so he's obviously getting outside of Canada a lot. He's worked with um, several researchers. He's given seminars in Latin America and Spanish. He's um, supervised students in Colombia, and Guatemala, and Mexico, among other places. And you may know him as Dr. Mosquito, as his other persona for which he, uh, he works on getting money for, um, to buy mosquito nets as an anti-malarial um, device in uh, villages in Africa. But we invite him to talk today as a scientific persona, as a Canada Research Chair. Thank you. Can you use it? Felix is known for his fiction. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to come here and share with you some of the things we do in the lab. And I'll start right out by saying, um, when I say we, I really mean they, and they being the researchers with whom I associate throughout Latin America, and they being the students who carry out much of the work in the lab. I like to use the word we because then it actually sort of includes me partially in the research that we do. Vectors and parasites, what can we learn? First of all, I'm going to make the assumption that all of you are not vector biologists, so we'll start with a bit of vector biology and then we'll get into the meat of what we actually like to do. And what we have is a resurgence of vector-borne diseases, depending on how you define it. It could be resurgence or re-emergence of disease in areas from which we had eradicated diseases. And this is a function of not only biological processes, but also geopolitical and economic reasons. We've got environmental problems, we've got vector resistance, biologically, to the insecticides. We have financial limitations re causing a reduction in vector control programs. We've got parasite resistance to chemotherapy. In times of civil strife, we have people moving around countries and continents, taking with them parasites or taking with them vectors. And political instability, we've seen recently in, in uh, Haiti, an outbreak of cholera, which they have not seen for 80 years. It's not vector-borne, but that's allegedly brought in by a foreigner, come in as a development worker to help solve the problem, in fact, exacerbated the problem. So are vector-borne diseases important? Please say yes, because that's what I've spent the rest of my life doing. But when we look at the TDR, Tropical Disease Research Unit of the WHO, they've... I'm trying, who's, who's outsourcing me? They've looked at 10 uh, major diseases in the tropics. When we look at tuberculosis and leprosy, they are not vector-transmitted but the rest of them are, and they cause significant disease and death, but they also cause significant morbidity, causing elephantiasis, or the massive swelling of legs and extremities, or disfiguring mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, which may not be lethal, but may certainly affect your ability to function in society. Take the classical case of malaria. We don't know how many people die from malaria every year. We have estimates. 
one million, three million, and we always put the larger number in our grant applications. But if we assume two million people die every year from malaria, that's 5,500 per, uh, per day. If we assume that a jumbo jet contains 400 people, that's essentially the equivalent of 14 jumbo jets crashing and burning every single day. If that were happening in North America, we'd probably see more of a, a concern than we actually see uh, for what's happening in, in the rest of the world. Vectors get their parasites usually when they fill up with blood. And certain people in the audience like Ian and Bruce have actually fed on their arms, so they know exactly what this process is all about. Sand flies. Usually they take up the parasite in their blood meal. Other insects have the parasites deposited inside them by a parasitoid or on their surface. Mind of its own. Now you've seen all the... Okay, once those parasites get in, there are massive fitness costs. So a parasite, by definition, is competing for resources. It uh, removes nutrients required by the host. It means it takes specific nutrients required for protein synthesis and vitellogenin for reproduction. It uh, competes with reproductive tissues. It ensures that the, the vector itself cannot function at maximum potential. So why do insects tolerate the presence of parasites or pathogens? There is a massive cost to some of these organisms. To the vectors that take up their parasites in blood, it may be a shorter lifespan, it may be a, a lowered reproductive output. For these insects and that have the parasites injected into them or on them, there's a simple cost, it is death. So if they do not kill the parasitoid or the developing larva, they die directly. So if those costs are there, why do insects tolerate the, parasite of path uh, the presence of pathogens? Why don't they kill them? What ability do insects have or vectors have to kill those parasites and pathogens? And ultimately what we'll talk about at the end is how can we exploit this? To understand this, we actually have to have a basic understanding of invertebrate immunology. And back in the 1800s, uh, Russian zoologist Eli Metchnikov visiting a Pasteur Institute started off a whole field by taking a rose thorn and sticking it into the larva of a starfish and watching these large cells come and try and phagocytose it. This was the beginning of cellular immunology and invertebrate immunology. We've come a long way since 1800 and something. Um, and we're now working out many of the biochemical pathways that these insects use when they want to uh, respond to a parasite or pathogen and want to eliminate it. It doesn't matter if you're an insect, a starfish, or any of the members of the audience, the first step has to be recognition. If you do not recognize the pathogen or parasite as non-self, as not part of you, you'll have no response against it. First step has to be non-self recognition. Insects don't have antibody-mediated um, immunity. It's all innate immunity, so it can't generate antibodies. Once it does recognize an organism, it has to regulate its response, and this is usually done through several biochemical pathways, and at the end, it turns on effector proteins or specific biochemical pathways that respond to a particular parasite. Complicated slide to show presence of pathogens are recognized. Hemocytes are essentially uh, analogous to our macrophages. They go circulating through the body cavity of the insect in the insect blood, and they look for parasites or pathogens. They do many other functions as well. If they find a compound that's very small, a bacterium, a fungal spore, they phagocytose it, very simply. And here we have an experimental situation by which we expose uh, hemocytes in, uh, in vivo to fluorescently labeled E. coli, within five minutes they are all phagocytosed within the, he the hemocyte and eliminated. Very simple, very effective. You can find no bacteria, no fungal spores within usually about three to five minutes. Some parasites which are transmitted by insects are too big to phagocytose. The Slide I showed earlier with the person with the massively swollen legs, elephantiasis, is caused by a big nematode, stylized here. It's too big to be phagocytosed. So the 
uh, insect goes through a biochemical pathway by which it deposits hemocytes on the surface of the nematode and then melanizes them to a point where this is the nematode coming at you. Behind the screen would be the blood inside the stomach of the insect. Nematode burrows through the wall and develops as a nice white nematode and gets transmitted. If it's recognized and killed, it gets cell deposition of the hemocytes and melanin on top of it to, to destroy it. They also produce many other what we call immune peptides or antimicrobial peptides, which are released at, in many tissues to try and eliminate uh, both larger and smaller uh, parasites or pathogens that have not yet uh, been eliminated by other means. And these antimicrobial peptides come in different shapes and colors, uh, different names. Bominin, Jacob are actually molecules we haven't published yet, which we've identified in the lab. We're, we're still working on characterization. Some are uh, lar very large molecules with, with uh, complex 3D structures. Defenses are relatively simple 3D structures, 3 disulfide bridges, and bominin and sacropin are simply uh, linear molecules. So if these defenses exist, where can they act? When the parasites, in the vast majority of cases with vectors, are going to come in with the blood, when the mosquito bites you, when the kissing bug bites you, the object is for them to take up blood, and here the insect's taken up blood, and the black circles with letters indicate sites or locations at which different parasites develop. Different parasites develop in different tissues. They have contact with those tissues. They destroy those tissues. A big nematode burrowing through what we call the paratrophic matrix and the mid-gut wall develops in the thoracic musculature has a different interaction than the viruses which develop in the wall and then swim through to the, if viruses can swim, to the salivary glands. And every time a parasite or a pathogen has interactions with these tissues, there is a potential for that insect to respond and produce its immune molecules or its phagocytosis or its uh, melanotic encapsulation to eliminate those parasites. But obviously it doesn't work because some of these insects actually transmit uh, certain uh, pathogens or parasites. And it's really important to note that some of these immune responses probably dictate why certain vectors only transmit certain parasites. The kissing bug transmits Chagas disease. It cannot transmit plasmodium that causes malaria. Aedes aegypti transmits dengue virus, cannot transmit plasm uh, human malaria. So if this system is so good, highly evolved in the group of organisms, the insects, which are probably the most successful in the history of the Earth, that's up for debate, of course, by the microbiologists in the crowd. Um, if this system is so highly evolved to eliminate the parasites and pathogens, how can they survive? Well, they can not activate the immune system, they can evade it, or they can inactivate it. This is the business end or the inside of a mosquito. This is essentially the esophagus. This is the stomach swollen because it has uh, blood on the other side of the membrane. And all these little circles here are a laboratory infection with plasmodium osis. This is the stage of plasmodium, the parasite that causes malaria, that sits on the midgut wall. This is experimental infection, so you see them everywhere. But in field collected mos mosquitoes, you'll only get two one, two, maybe three of these oocysts, and they're always located in this region of the stomach, or the mid-gut of the mosquito, always. When we look at the, and by developing in the wall of the mosquito, it is uh, isolated. The oocyst is isolated from the hemocytes, therefore they cannot phagocytose them. They're also relatively, relatively hidden from um, the biochemical processes that produce the melanin to encapsulate it and they can be exposed to the immune peptides we talked about, the other form of the uh, immune system. And when we look at where sacropin and defensin are expressed as the two major immune peptides in mosquitoes, when we look at where they're expressed, they're expressed in the anterior region of the lighter green, the anterior region of the uh, esophagus, nowhere else in the gut, Defensin in the very anterior region and in the posterior region, which is essentially the region which is analogous to the kidneys, what we call the malpighian tubules. There is no defensin and no sacropin expressed 
in the region where we always find the oocyst. So essentially they are developing in an area for which there, in which there is very, very little uh, immunity. Switch to Chagas disease, which is a different parasite, very different mode of transmission. This is the vector. Uh, it's a member of the kissing bug group. Blood once again goes in. Parasites differentiate and develop in the GI tract. And what we see on the bottom panel is an insect feeding. As the insect swells, it wants to get rid of the water content of the blood and keep just a protein in the cells. The insect therefore defecates on your skin as it feeds and shown up here stylized, the feces will contain the parasites which then work their way into your skin through uh, soft membranes, enter your blood system and begin the infection. This is an extremely inefficient mode of transmission. The probability of the fecal sample landing on your skin is remote and the probability of the parasites making their way through your skin is not very good, yet this is the life cycle of the parasite. Why? We don't know, obviously, we weren't there to monitor all the evolution and developments, but if T. cruci, the parasite that causes Chagas disease, if it goes through the gut tissues and enters the body cavity, what happens? It's killed. A combination of phagocytosis and a combination of immune peptides eliminate the parasite. So parasite is sensitive to immune molecules. What we, the community, what Ben Beard from CDC has done is he's expressed um, I'll go back. This insect has symbiotic bacteria in its gut to help it digest the blood. And Ben Beard um, did uh, a transgenesis, making those bacteria express immune peptides. And he went through a series of immune peptides and found that, yes, indeed, this parasite is, in fact, susceptible to these compounds. So if these immune peptides and the parasite come in contact, the parasite dies. Yet these compounds are not normally produced in the gut in high enough concentrations to kill the parasite. So by maintaining its existence in the intestine and having an extremely inefficient route of transmission, the parasite survives. What happens with intracellular parasites? The one we use for our studies is, is uh, an arbovirus. Arboviruses are arthropod-borne viruses, usually tick mosquitoes. Uh, the one we use mainly is dengue virus, which in my opinion, is the next big plague that's going to hit us. It's one of the most geographically widespread viruses. There are 50 to 100 million new infections annually, 500 cases of dengue hemorrhagic fever, which you see hemorrhaging here, and there are no drugs and there is no vaccine. And treatment is essentially making sure that uh, bodies are hydrated and hope the body can respond on its own. Because they are intracellular, they're not available for eradication or elimination by the common, commonly accepted three prongs of immune uh, defenses in insects. So how does a virus get in, what does it do, and how does the mosquito eliminate it? Normally we accept that apoptosis or programmed cell death is the major mechanism by which many of us and many organisms eliminate either abnormal cells, cells that are behaving wrong, cells that did not form correctly, or cells that uh, have internal parasites or pathogens. In the case of viruses, it's cells which have been invaded by viruses usually respond very quickly, undergo apoptosis, turn around and eliminate, uh, get to a point where the cell is then uh, um, sloughed off and or phagocytosed by macrophages and the virus is eliminated before it can get going. So it can essentially reduce virus pro uh, progeny uh, development and multiplication before the virus gets going, except that some parasites, including trypanosoma, that causes Chagas disease, a related parasite, leishmania, and many of the viruses can actually modulate the host apoptotic system. I, I, I promise there wouldn't be too many pathways in this uh, talk. There are, this, is a, this is the most simple pathway you'll ever see for apoptosis. So if you're going to have to memorize one, memorize a simple one. And keep in mind the circles, drunk and dread are caspases. These are molecules that destroy your cells, initiate apoptosis, to get rid of that infected cell. They're pro-apoptotic. 
IAP stands for inhibitor of apoptosis. This molecule prevents apoptosis. So whether or not a cell will undergo apoptosis or not depends on the very fine balance between IAP and the caspases. One causes apoptosis, one prevents it. And when we look at what happens in a mosquito that transmits uh, dengue virus, Aedes aegypti, we have expression of drunk, the molecule that causes apoptosis, goes up massively around 24 hours after the mosquito has taken a blood meal containing the virus. This is a time at which the virus is leaving the blood meal, moving into the cells of the mosquito stomach or the midgut, and starting to develop. And what we find is we see a massive increase as the virus starts to go in. This is nowhere to be seen by 48 hours. Coincidentally, IAP, the inhibitor of apoptosis, is absent at the beginning, but is there massively at 48 hours. So the, the pro-apoptotic expression uh, of drunk starts apoptosis, and all of a sudden, for reasons we don't know, that process is stopped by the fact that the virus is there and the virus is actually inducing the expression of an inhibitor. What's hap why is that beneficial? Dengue enters the cells, the mosquito activates the apoptosis, the virus overexpresses the inhibitor of apoptosis, apoptosis is stopped. Virus goes through multiple replications, the cell is now full of a dengue virus, it stops its IAP expression, cells burst, virions move out and then infect new cells and repeat the process itself. We believe. We haven't published the data, so people haven't peer-reviewed it, so we believe. So how can we disprove this? Well, as mentioned by Felix, we work a lot in Colombia uh, with a group in Cali, and they have found feral mosquitoes. These are not lab-reared mosquitoes. These are feral populations which are uh, resistant to the virus. In other words, the virus will not develop inside them. So what we've done is we've compared both our apoptosis assays and our gene expression studies uh, in the susceptible and the refractory strains after exposure to dengue virus. And then to play around with the system, we use RNAi, a technique to stop the transcription or stop the production of, stop transcription of certain molecules. Therefore, there are no proteins d uh, down the line. I had about 12 slides I was going to show, and I cut it down to one. I'm sure you'll be happy. This is the resistant strain. So essentially what happens is the resistant strain, the expression of caspase 16, which is, which is a pro-apoptotic, it kills the cells, or DRONC, or IAP, the inhibitor of apoptosis. The black bars are the levels expressed after taking up a blood meal. The gray bars are the levels expressed after taking up a meal containing dengue virus. And what we find is by 24 to 36 hours, a 16-fold increase in caspase 16, an unprecedented 65 to 70 fold increase in drunk, and a three fold increase, three to four fold increase in IAP. In the susceptible strain, these levels are stay around two to three, maybe two to five, and the IAP stays around the, this, these levels. So what we believe is happening is that the virus gets in into a susceptible mosquito, the caspase is turned on, the virus counteracts that by turning on the inhibitor of apoptosis, and the virus develops. In a resistant strain, what we believe is happening is that the increase in IAP, the inhibitor, is not enough to dampen the, the massive amounts of apoptosis going on. The insects eliminate the virus with apoptosis and are refractory. To carry on these studies, we actually studied, uh, we knocked down some of these genes. So if we knock down DRONC, that's pro-apoptotic, we knock down caspase, which is getting rid of the virus, then the virus should develop very well. Or if we knock down the inhibitor in susceptible mosquitoes, there should be no inhibition of apoptosis anymore, and what should happen is, in the susceptible mosquitoes, they should now become resistant. Ultimately, our goal would be to uh, persuade all the mosquitoes not to turn on their IAP, not inhibit viral development, sorry, not inhibit apoptosis, allow apoptosis to take place and kill the virus. So we'll start off with IAP. What we did, 
we knocked normal expression levels down by about 80%. And this is a classic example of the surgery was a success, but unfortunately the patient died. We knocked down apoptosis, thinking we could then infect with the virus. And because we knocked down the inhibitor of apoptosis, I'm sorry, we knocked down the inhibitor, apoptosis went rampant and the whole, all the mosquitoes died. The good thing is that dead mosquitoes don't transmit dengue virus, so it would be a great, could we do, but it's really difficult injecting the double-stranded RNA into every single mosquito. So we had to halt this for a bit. We're now actually repeating this, trying to have a, a tissue-specific uh, reduction only in the mid-gut. But when we knock down the pro-apoptotic molecules, the caspases, we normally expect about 30% of, of the resistant colony to uh, transmit the virus. This is, we have a colony of resistant mosquitoes that is only about 65% truly resistant. When we knock down caspase 16 or DRONC, we knock down the molecules that cause the ap apoptosis, 83 to 100% of the mosquitoes now become susceptible. So from a biochemical point of view, from an experimental point of view, we can demonstrate the role of immune molecules, the role of immune responses in determining whether or not a mosquito will transmit or not transmit dengue virus. The problem is we're really successful in converting resistant mosquitoes into susceptible, which is exactly the opposite of what we want. So uh, that's on the back burner. Although if we want to use dengue as a bio, what's the NIH called call now? Biological research, weapons research, all the rest of it, we could actually turn all the mosquitoes into susceptible and then transmit them to our country where we want to control the problem and we have the answer. So in terms of dengue, Aegyp Aegyptia aegypti uses apoptosis to eliminate dengue virus. The virus induces the expression of inhibitors, refractory strains, the expression of the pro-apoptotic genes is so high that it's not dampened by the inhibitors. Knocking down IAP should change the phenotype from S to R, but the phenotype is, is lethal. So the question, one of the questions we have is, if resistant strains produce so much a pro-apoptotic molecules, all the caspases, why don't they die normally in the field from excessive apoptosis? What is the cost benefit? What is the trade-off between being resistant and, and not being resistant? If you are resistant and mounting this immune response to get rid of a virus, there must be some benefit to you. And we can find absolutely no effect of dengue virus on mosquito populations. In terms of longevity, in terms of output of offspring, we don't know what the cost is, and therefore we have no understanding of why or how they develop resistance. Okay, getting back to the crux of the title of the talk. How can we use insect immune compounds to help humans? Chances are we're not going to be able to induce humans to develop phagocytic, more phagocytic cells like hemocytes to phagocytose molecules, so we'll probably throw out that. We don't use melanotic encapsulation responses to get rid of parasites, so we probably won't use that. But there's been a lot of work going on from the immune peptides which have been isolated from insects, and uh, some of these uh, are antibacterial, are being tested now, um, in phase uh, uh, two trials. There's one antifungal component, a compound which has been commercialized in Europe, and I believe it's used for an extremely beneficial function in Europe, that is treating shower curtains so they don't mildew. We have an antiparasite uh, molecule being tested in animals right now, and there are two antiviral molecules in, in phase two against hepatitis and herpes. So the question is, can, can we exploit immune peptides from these insects as new antibiotics. I'll remind you that the field of understanding immune peptides is very, very, very new. The first immune peptide from an insect was identified in Sweden in 1983 or 85. The first peptide, and then was, things were pretty well put on, uh, on hold. 1995 came the first publications of an immune peptide in a vector that might have an effect upon a parasite. So we're looking at 15 years of research going from crude pr protein purification to the genomics and proteomics era. 
So we had a research aim of trying to say, could we develop potent antibiotics using insect antimicrobial peptides, or what we call AMPs, as the model for designing new antibiotics? With the desired characteristics of having a low, minimal inhibitory concentration, and a very low concentration of drug to eliminate the, the pathogen, usually a fungus, a virus, or a bacterium. Importantly, you have to have a very low toxicity to the host. And can we target or can we tailor our development of a molecule to a specific pathogen or a specific group of pathogens? All of you have read the newspapers. All of you know that antibiotic resistance in hospitals, in old folks' homes, in nurseries is a major problem. And many of the compounds that we use are keys that we use to open the door into the bacterium, to open the doors, understand what they do, and to enter the world of bacterial physiology or fungal physiology. And once we keep opening this door long enough, the bacterium goes ahead and changes the locks, and uh, we have to start all over again. This is extremely fine work, uh, understanding exactly what processes go on, how to get in through the bacterium, how to interfere with some of the process inside. I'm not sure if it's a function of me or my lab group, but we take a more of a bull in a china shop approach. We knock the heck out of it by targeting specific structures on the outside, conserved membranes of bacteria or fungi that we don't believe the bacterium will be able to, to alter very, very easily and continue to, to survive. So we're basing this on the fact that antimicrobial peptides use a generalized attack and that microbes might not easily be able to change some of the targets that we, we've identified. So these antimicrobial peptides are uh, coming, as we said earlier, great shapes, colors, sizes. And characteristic of, of some of these is that they're small, they're cationic, they're attracted to and bind to cell surfaces. The cell surfaces. They often form these uh, helices once they either, either in solution in the blood or in the insect blood or when they approach and attach to a membrane. And so this is one of the characteristics we're trying to exploit. These antimicrobial peptides, once they bind to the membrane, they compromise and they make a hole. And there are a whole bunch of theories out there exactly how they make these holes and these uh, barrel stave or toroidal pore formation is irrelevant for this discussion, but essentially they make channels in the membrane of the, of the microbe, and you have a flux of ions going in and out. Sometimes that's enough to kill the organism. Or some of the AMPs are reported to go inside the cell and in effect, uh, interfere with DNA replication, uh, messenger RNA synthesis, protein synthesis, protein formation, folding, etc. Buforin is a peptide from a frog. Pyrocorsin is from an insect. Drosocin is actually a uh, Drosophila molecule. Apidacin is from uh, honeybees. Each of these has been studied and has a different effect inside the, the cell. This is usually a bacterial cell. So the whole idea is if we can get amps into the bacterium, can we create new drugs? The problem is many of our amps are effective against bacteria or against parasites. The problem is that we can never deliver a high enough concentration to wipe out a bacterial uh, population. So the idea is can we modify existing antimicrobial peptides into novel targets? So we have um, three molecules of, of interest here and what is common to all of them is that they have to have a motif on them that binds to the surface of the, in our case, the bacterium, and another motif that actually makes the hole, penetrates, and causes the problem. We call this our Lego design. Um, we are trying to create hybrid amps, or what we call HAMPs, because we're going to combine structures implicated in different aspects of known antimicrobial peptides, how different structures from different peptides bind and or enter and or interrupt processes within those cells. And then we design them, we express them, we purify them, uh, and we mix and match parts of molecules 
to try and tailor our approach to developing uh, more potent molecules. And we call it Lego because essentially we take the yellow piece off the yellow Lego toy and we put it, attach it to the blue component of the blue Lego toy and we create a new peptide. Standard AMP, and we use sacropin as our model because sacropin is probably the easiest molecule with which to work. It has no significant secondary structures. It's a small alpha helix joined by a hinge to another small alpha helix described here. One is binds to the bacterium and one kills it. The concept is now we take the binding motif that binds to a certain group of organisms and put on a different killing motif, a different motif that either penetrates differently, causes holes differently, or affects the cell differently. Then we turn around and add another killing motif on the other side of our binding motif, so that now should, heaven forbid, a bacterium start to develop resistance against one of the killing motifs, uh, chances are it won't be able to do two at the same time. And in some of our controls, we put two binding motifs uh, flanking a killing motif, we haven't actually made this molecule yet, but we're pretty sure it will be ineffective because this motif usually has to make the hole into the cell and this is not, does not have a free end by which you can do it. And then we actually have made, um, we will make a, a peptide with two killing motifs and we have made one with two binding motifs, which essentially is ineffective. So these are the, the, the blocks, the Lego blocks that we're using to make our, our some of our new our new molecules. Once we get those done, we have to turn around and figure out if they actually work. And several ways of doing this, which is time consuming, and there's at least one grad, uh, undergraduate student in the crowd who knows what this is all about. We either synthesize these AMPs or HAMPs, or we actually make an artificial gene, put it into an expression vector, express it, purify it, HPLC purify it, and that depends on the 3D structure of the molecule because we're starting to get into design of a molecule with disulfide bridges and beta parallel sheets, which is harder to synthesize and have it full normally. We can express these in yeast. Or, interestingly enough, we can actually express, express antibacterial peptides in bacteria. Sounds uh, illogical, but actually works. And then we can uh, synthesize or express our, our HAMPs, disk diffusion assays in which we can take a whole bunch of bacteria, plate it on a plate, put a disk uh, filter paper onto the bacterial growth and see do we have a ring of inhibition. And the distance or the clearing area is a function of the uh, toxicity of that compound to uh, bacteria. We can actually then do a, a proper MIC assay by which we actually um, calculate the concentration of our HAMP or the individual AMPs from which they came uh, in terms of how toxic is this and how does this compare to the parent molecule from which we took pieces to assemble our HAMPs or how toxic is it compared to commercially available antibiotics. I'm trying to put down some data for this I actually didn't, I never assembled all the data at one time. We have sheaths and sheaths of data which really don't tell us a whole bunch. What we're finding is that even though the antimicrobial compound that we're making, the HAMP, is active against, in terms of gram-positive bacteria, one gram-positive bacterium, it's not equally toxic to all gram-positive bacteria. Similarly, this uh, HAMP that we designed, ACDC, is uh, not effective whatsoever against serratia, but it's actually quite good against E. coli and very good against Enterobacter. And what we're trying to do right now is put together some structure function relationships and trying to understand what is required in a binding motif to really affix and attach strongly to either a particular strain of bacteria or a group of bacteria, i.e. all gram-positive bacteria, or can we design specific HAMPs against tuberculosis that will not affect other uh, bacteria in your system. This is the uh, parent Aedes aegypti sacropin. This is Drosophila melanogaster sacropin. The AC means uh, uh, Aedes sacropin binding motif and DC is not the rock band. DC is Drosophila uh, sacropin killing motif 
And when we combine them against the parent molecule, sometimes we're really lucky, and uh, most times we're not. This, in this case here, either parent is more lethal than the HAP itself. In this case, for some unknown reason, uh, the ACAH, which is a completely different peptide, is very, very good against certain gram-positive bacteria. And I haven't put the whole list up here because um, there's just not enough space on the slide. So we are discouraged, very discouraged, because we don't have a uniform response against all bacteria of the same group. We're very, very encouraged because of other experiments that we have going on. Encouraged because we can actually do this process. So right now, we're using uh, some computer software to actually help design and infer killing motifs and um, binding motifs. And we have a whole series of uh, uh, peptide arrays that we'll be assessing in terms of binding to bacteria and then developing those as the basis for some of our uh, HAMP work. We can alter the target and specificity and the MIC of certain uh, of certain of our uh, antimicrobial peptides. We can mix the binding motifs and the killing motifs. We have two I've shown here. We have three others which we have ass assessed and we are designing and making new ones. The idea is that we can test newly designed and binding motifs alone. So we take a binding motif alone and make sure it really does bind strongly to its target. And then with killing motifs, putative, because they haven't been proven yet, to compare with the parent molecules from which we took those molecules, and a stepwise but very time-consuming laborious process, ultimately come up with a new binding motif that we can then combine with different lethal uh, motifs to actually create new antibiotics. They have to be toxic to the microbes we want to kill. It doesn't do much good if you have an infection and I can kill the microbe in you, but as a secondary effect, you also die. Some of the, there are, I believe, three other studies which have made hybrid molecules like this. One used um, a peptide from a honeybee, and it killed every eukaryotic cell it got near. To date, um, we take all our HAMPs, or the binding motifs, or the putative uh, killing motifs, and we test them for hemolysis of, of red blood cells, usually human cells, and to date, none of our HAMPs that we have made, and with pure luck, have any toxicity whatsoever to eukaryotic cells. So the big benefit is it will kill bacteria. Some of them will kill fungi, but to date, none of the ones we've designed and constructed have actually damaged vertebrate cells. So we've identified insect immune peptides, which are lethal to specific parasites. Uh, these are the five that we work with mainly. And what I haven't talked about I did mention that sometimes we can't express these in high enough concentrations to kill bacteria. Similarly, in the insects, when they get infected with parasites, they are not produced normally in high enough concentrations to kill parasites. Some of our colleagues in the States have used our peptides to generate transgenic insects, mainly transgenic mosquitoes, which now are refractory to, to particular parasites. The idea is, could you replace a feral population with a transgen uh, transgenic population that would no longer transmit the parasite and therefore reduce transmission. This is an extremely controversial area of study. And as this analogy I use is that try and tell a village in Africa that you are releasing 600 gazillion mosquitoes for their benefit. And it's, it's, it's sort of a hard case to sell. Uh, potentially, we have new antibiotic drugs based on immune peptides. And we know that the route to discovery of antibiotics is, is difficult, is expensive. Uh, the arsenal we have now to treat human infections is getting more and more limited. We see stories of C. difficile in hospitals and clinics in eastern North America. We have uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus in many hospitals, etc. So we are coming up against microbes that uh, have resistance to existing compounds. And what we'd like to think is that our amps could be used and almost discarded by modifying uh, killing motifs as, develop, as resistance develops. I have no doubt that resistance will develop to a HAMP as it does to other molecules, but the thing is, can we save ourselves some time while we do more research into other molecules? When you work, as Felix mentioned, in the field, doing vector host 
parasite studies or in the lab, sometimes the pieces of the puzzle fall together. And you actually have a nice story to tell and you can actually explain and justify what you're doing. Sometimes a piece comes in and has no relevance whatsoever and it doesn't fit anywhere and you have to try and figure out how to carve it up so it will fit in. And with the hamps, that's what we're doing right now. We're in that trying to understand uh, usually in the whole organism, vector host interactions as a parasite, how environmental conditions, especially in Latin America, will affect disease transmission as uh, climate change takes place, increases or shrinks vector habitat, etc. But I don't care if it's a malaria parasite, the plasmodium, or if it's T. cruzi that causes Chagas disease, or if it's a bacterium living in a human host. The parasites have evolved their lifestyle, their life cycle, their life system to survive in the presence of the immune system of their host. The parasites have developed different mechanisms to survive, evade, eliminate, interrupt your host response. The parasites have to be one step ahead of the immune responses. Go back to the Red Queen hypothesis. Uh, no matter how fast you run, you end up staying in the same place. These parasites have evolved extremely well. So if you're going to go out and bet, you can go bet on Lotto Max this week for $50 million, or you can bet on the parasite. I know where I, where I put my money. I know how to win. I bet on the parasite, but it's difficult to get someone to take the bet and pay off. A lot of people have gone into helping me uh, open my eyes and understand the stuff. Usually the, uh, the way it works is the master's students do the work, the PhD students explain to me how it works, and then I give the presentation. Um, I've been extremely lucky to have had some really, really, really good graduate students at SFU, uh, especially people like uh, Don Cooper who did a PhD, uh, Raul Ursuk who did a PhD, Ranil Walabatiya who just submitted, uh, just finished his PhD. A uh, very talented, hardworking group of uh, undergraduates at SFU. Uh, obviously, to people in the States, mainly to Bruce Christensen, who uh, gave me my first chance as a postdoc and said, uh, I think you should do something on insect immunity. Go see what we know about it. And uh, I got really, really, really lucky. Clara Ocampo uh, is the main collaborator in Colombia, where we work on dengue virus and uh, Jacobo Vizioli and Philippe Boulet, who were my first two collaborators in France, who uh, taught me how to use the HPLC and uh, what proteins meant. All of these people have some funding of some sort. Most of it's come from these funding agencies. Obviously, I'm appreciative to the CRC program, to NSERC, um, to CIHR, Michael Smith Foundation. Col Ciencias is the, the NSERC equivalent in the government of Colombia. And as Felix mentioned most recently, to the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who actually were persuaded that our idea of developing HAMPS m probably wouldn't work, but it sounded so weird that they just decided to fund it anyway. And with that, I'll close and try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Carl. So please use the mic. Unas preguntas, señor. <laughs> Con mucho gusto. Um, what I'd like to do, um, what I'd like to ask is, if you you have the binding motif and the killer motif, am I right in saying the binding motif is an amphiphilic peptide, usually which um, which uh, binds to the um, binds to some polar heads, perhaps in the in the lipid membrane of the or, or in the membrane, and then the killer motif is a pore former. Is this correct? Um, now, when you have that, is, is, would it be worthwhile, and we're interest, I'm interested in these experiments, to um, actually, or maybe they're done already, to take something like a liposome, a lipid bilayer, but not just any old lipid bilayer like BPPC, which everybody knows and loves and doesn't occur that much in nature, but to make a lipid bilayer, which we're very interested, which has the major characteristics of the cell membrane, and then have a look at pore formation doing that. Has anybody done anything like that? People have studied natural interactions of the AMPs in yes, forming pores and yes. synthetic molecules. What you're describing, I don't know anyone has done it. Because I, I know that Yetheri, we, we wrote a paper long ago playing with a bit of maths on, on the basis of Yetheri's paper. And, uh, and one of the problems is, there's also another problem, that is that sometimes you you have these complex, you, your system could have a complex structure. Absolutely. Which, which is a structure that, that, um, that, that 
forms on top of the membrane and then sinks into the membrane. So you could have several things. That's why I find, I, from a lipid point of view, I find that very interesting. The last point I'd like to make is, would it be worth just making a sort of a polymer of, uh, a, a long polymer of, um, uh, which might go all over the membrane, of binder killer, binder killer, binder killer? If they're, depending on how they're hooked, be because we believe that the, uh, the C-terminals of the killing motif has to be free. So, so it can't be bound. So when I talked about the, the controls we're using, we're putting killing motif between two binding motifs. We're pretty sure it's not going to work because that, binding, that killing motif has to penetrate. The, uh, so could you, could you actually put a, a sort of a, the right peptidic polymer? We think we can, but we're not smart enough to do that. So I, I now know who to come and talk to. <laughs> I'm a theorist. You better not talk to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Beautiful lecture. Yeah, Carl, from a perspective of a, of a research program, um, have you guys gone through all of the sarcopins from insects to find which one is the most potent in its killing motif, and then you went from that? Because like you you didn't, that side of the, that table had very few entries, and you, you'd think that's where you would start before you started making these things, was just find the... Which, which the table, table you, were, you were unhappy with because some of oh, the... Oh, those, those, those are microbes amps. that were testing the hams. Right, but, what, but you, would test the, you would test the amps first and all those microbes to find the, the broadest we know, spectrum. We know all the MICs of all the amps against some bacteria. But, uh, but, so I'm, that's what I'm asking, is, is, is one of the stages in the research program to run the amps on, define which is the broadest spectrum amp, because that's where you make the amps but from. The trouble is that a sacropin is called a sacropin because of sequence similarity. Some sacropins are active against gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, and fungi. Some sacropins are active only against gram-positive bacteria. Some are against only uh, fungi. So what we're trying to do is maintain our database of looking at structure function relationships to try and figure out which ones is it the binding motif and, or is it the killing motif of the, those innate molecules which is, is causing the difference. The two major groups which have sacropins are the lepidopteran and the diptera, and their binding motifs are completely different. And so what we're trying to do is trying to figure out which is best to use and which is best to combine. So uh, the answer is we don't know all the answers yet, but we're trying to work through structure function, and the ones I described were mosquito sacropins, but we've also got the, uh, the original one, high for sacropia uh, molecule as well. Oh, thanks very much for the talk, Carl. I have a very naive question about how feral mosquitoes evolve resistance to certain viruses. So if, if there's selective pressures at work that might um, cause a mosquito to be resistant, it seems like you're, you're considering only the female side of the mosquito life cycle. Is it possible that the males are living in some unusual situation in that environment and that's the males that are actually accountable for the resistance, and that by changing the type of flower or something that's growing in the area, you could we'll admit uh, deliberately that perturb the system to we'll favor admit, resistance. You'll admit that the, fem that the male probably never sees the virus. Well, I, right? I mean, because I'm males don't blood feed. something in the environment that the male right. induces in the male a response that is later. Um, hmm? we, don't, we don't know. So we, don't, we can't measure any cost of dengue to the mosquito either in male, female, longevity, anything. So we can't ascribe, we can't figure out why they would have developed particular resistance to a dengue virus. It may be a carryover from resistance to something else. We fully admit that. But I'm not sure at this moment how we, how we pull that out. But is there something unique about the geographical area that is somehow different in terms of what the male would encounter? We can actually, we've, we're using a population around the city of Cali, but there are other studies in other parts of Colombia and one out of Peru that also has described a, a proportion of uh, population of mosquitoes not responding normally to infection with dengue. There are lab colonies which people have specifically selected under high pressure to become resistant. Okay, and you can look at the uh, uh, data on, on difference in genetics and all the rest of it. But that's a different situation from, we believe, from what is occurred all by itself in the field. We don't know if it's got something to do with uh, insecticide applications for a secondary effect. We don't know if we have selected for particular genes because certain insecticides are used in certain areas and they're not used in other areas. We don't know what environmental factors are, are contributing.
Yeah, so so you were, the, the hypothesis is that the dengue virus up regulates the IAP molecule. And are dengue viruses, are they, have, have their genome been sequenced? And is it really, could you look in there and say, well, you know, is there a gene that obviously could possibly do that? Or is it? The many viruses actually have IAPs in their genome to express viral IAPs in their host to prevent apoptosis. Uh, dengue virus does not have that. It, it induces the expression of endogenous IAP. So it is a but mosquito I mean, IAP. You, that's a hypothesis that it does that. Well, it, it doesn't have any of its own IAP to express. I guess I'm just kind of naively saying, can you, since they're such simple organisms, can you point and say, oh yeah, that's the gene that turns on IAP in your... I don't think you can say that it's a simple organism. <laughs> if it were simple, we might be able to understand it, but it's, it's um, we don't understand yet, admittedly, what genes turn on. Um, a lot of data has come out recently saying it is an RNA, RNAi mechanism that the mosquitoes use to get rid of it, and that the virus interrupts the RNAi, which RNAi is considered by some to be an antiviral strategy in the first place. Um, these studies suggest that apoptosis, in fact, in fact, we've looked at some of the major RNAi um, impl implicated genes in, in mosquitoes, and they're not turned on whatsoever in resistant or susceptible mosquitoes during dengue or not with dengue. We do not know how IAP is triggered. Just another lipid question, but on apoptosis. I love lipids, and particularly cholesterol. People make me, uh, people always tease me about that. But um, to get back to the um, uh, the apoptosis idea with regard to lipids, I mean, as you must know much better than me, in um, in, in in human apoptosis, one way that it's triggered is that the sphingomyelin on the on the inner membrane goes to the outer membrane, and then um, the sphingomyelin A appears and 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 clips the uh, and 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 and, and um, clips the part of the head off, making it into ceramide, which can form these sort of solid uh, um, domains. Is there is there any equivalent mechanism that happens in these systems, or would it be worth looking at? Because to some extent, that's what Jennifer Thewalt is. And her student Sherry is definitely uh, worth looking at. I don't think it's ever been described yeah. in our system. Thank you. If not, let us thank our speaker once more. Thank you, Carl.